everyone, Stephen Kirkpatrick with Executive Speakers Bureau. Uh, on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for taking a short time out of your day to learn more about this amazing book, uh, The Jolt Effect. The Jolt Effect has been getting some amazing buzz, and we have one of its co-authors and one of our managed speakers with us today to talk to you all about it. Matt Dixon uh, is known for his provocative work, provocative work in the areas of sales, customer service, and customer experience. He's the author of three Amazon and Wall Street Journal bestselling books, The Challenger Sale, which has sold over a million copies worldwide, The Effortless Experience, and Challenger Customer. Uh, Matt's coming to us from sunny DC area, where he's probably gonna go hit the golf course after we're done here and shoot another course record of 66. So without further ado, Matt, come on in, man. How are you? I'm doing well, Stephen. I, I don't know about I don't know about that. Maybe 66 on the front nine. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, Matt, listen, now too. is not the time for you to be all <laughs> humble about how many course records you have and how many different courses all over the right, right. world. Like I said, I said world. I meant to say not country, but world. Come on, everyone knows what you sales guys do. Just go on the golf course and make sales and do deals, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, actually, that's not about what this book is, is about how to play golf for your life, you know, for, for a living. Um, but anyways, so I want to go ahead and dive into it. So Challenger Sale, Challenger Customer, Everless Experience, sold a million copies worldwide based upon amazing research. Talk to me kind of about the inspiration for wanting to write this, this, this new book. Yeah, I uh, know it's, uh, it's got an interesting story. I think, um, you know, I still have flashbacks, I think, from the first two sales books. Obviously, effortless experience is more on customer experience, customer service. Many of the folks on the on the Zoom will will know that book from from that uh, that functional area. But we've done two other books on sales, challenger sale, challenger customer. And, uh, you know, the question of like what inspired us to go do another one uh, is an interesting one. So there's two there's two things, Stephen, we've been tracking uh, as sales researchers for the past few years. The first one is the rise in uh, no decision losses that the average salesperson is experiencing. So these are customers who go through the entire sales process only to do nothing, you know, or get to the say they want to buy from you, but not end up signing on the dotted line. And um, and this is a these are the customers that ghost you, that go radio silent on you, eventually mark them in the CRM system as close loss, no decision. And it's a huge deadweight loss for the salesperson. It's a huge productivity sink for the average sales organization. Um, and this has been something we've been tracking. We see this on a steady rise for reasons we'll talk about uh, here in a moment. And, you know, arguably it's getting a lot worse. I, I talked to folks last week in San Francisco at the Dreamforce event, and I was talking to sales leaders and they said they've seen like a five to 10% spike in no decision losses just in the past month, you know, uh, as the economy takes a turn for the worse. So there's a secular trend that was like the issue I was really focused on um, as a sales researcher, but um, there, something interesting happened uh, that really changed the game for us uh, in terms of how we did the research. So if you go back to March of 2020, which is, you know, the time we were all uh, learning to bake sourdough bread and watching Tiger King and things like that. Um, that was good times. We all remember when we all went into lockdown. But because I'm a research nerd, I saw this as a golden opportunity to study sales in a way it had never been studied before. Um, you know, sales went from somewhat virtual where some of our sales calls were were on Zoom or Teams or WebEx to 100% virtual overnight. And so what we did is we went out and we launched something called the Sales Vaccine Project. We actually decided, hey, if scientists can figure out a way to to um, address you know the pandemic, then maybe we could figure out a way to address what's broken with sales. So we partnered with several dozen companies and we collected two and a half million recorded sales conversations from a whole range of industries, markets, geographies. And we use a machine learning platform to study those at scale. So we think this is the largest single study that's ever been completed of sales conversations, literally where the rubber hits the road in the sale. And, and what we did is we looked at it specifically, again, from that perspective of, of no decision. What is it that, that causes customers to make no decision? And what do the best salespeople do to avoid that happening to them? Okay, so back to the research, I mean, two and a half million sales calls. I mean. Yeah. That's a huge number in, like, in a lot of data. Did you have any kind of preconceived notions of kind of what you thought you were going to find? And then kind of talk yeah. about like the significant question that you were like, wow, like th this is really what I, what I gleaned from all this. Yeah, you know, I think the conventional wisdom in sales has always been that, you know, because again, we're thinking about this topic of what leads to a no decision loss and what do the best salespeople do differently. And the conventional wisdom in sales had always been that the, you know, the only reason a customer gets cold feet, that they would ghost you, that they would go radio silent, that they would become unresponsive, 
the only reason is that you fail to defeat their status quo, right? Either they believe what they do today is good enough, they don't believe your, your offer, your product, or your service is a more compelling alternative, or maybe they don't believe this is a high enough priority for that for them personally or for their organization. So any number of those reasons has to be the reason the customer goes to you. It's got to basically come back to value. And so the way we get the customer, the way we break the status quo is we dial up the FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. We we talk about, um, we, we re-articulate the benefits of our product or our service. You know, Stephen, you must have missed the part in the demo where I showed you how awesome our platform was. Let me show you again. You know, mm -hmm. did, Stephen, did you see how many zeros were on that ROI projection and how awesome this is going to be for your business? Or I try to dial up a little bit of the FUD, you know, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, try to make you squirm a little bit about your current state. Uh, create this burning platform and, and make you realize the cost of your inaction. Here's all the bad stuff that's going to happen to you if you don't buy our solution and solve this uh, problem or go after this opportunity. And if those things don't work, you know, typically what we'll do is we'll take out our bag of sales tricks, like the disappearing discount. Like, hey, uh, you know, I cut you a discount, yeah. but you got to buy this quarter, right? Uh, or the limited inventory or like, hey, I'm, uh, maybe we're a software company and like we've got a limited window to implement the solution. And if you don't sign up now, it might be six months before you can install it for your organization. So, it, But it's all about dialing up the FOMO. And in our hypothesis, I think, to your question, Stephen, was that with an increase in losses to no decision, then clearly maybe customers have become immune to the way that the ways that we broke down the status quo. Maybe there's a different way of doing it. Ten, you know, More than 10 years ago, we wrote about challenger selling. Uh, challengers bring new insights that change the way the customer thinks about their own opportunities, their own business, and ultimately think differently about you as a supplier. And so we thought, well, maybe there's a new playbook for beating the status quo, but it, it turned out that wasn't what we found at all. So why do customers make no decision? Yeah, that's a, that is there the you go. Uh, lead right into it. So it turns out it's not uh, it's not a lack of FOMO that gets our customers not to move forward and come out, get off the fence. It's actually FOMO. And so you might know, what? Steve. Yeah, you know. So you know, I'm not cool enough to come up with some. My kids say I'm not even cool enough to use FOMO, but but I'll tell you. Again, the, the standard playbook in hey, sales. Hey, quick question. So, how, how do you spell FOMO? I'll get I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. So FOMO, we know uh, the FOMO is the fear of missing out, and that is what we've taught salespeople for years and years. If the customer's on the fence, if they start to you know backpedal and get cold feet and waffle and waver and straddle the fence and and start to ghost us, you got to dial up the FOMO. You know, create the burning platform. Tell them all the you know, re rearticulate the benefits and feeds and speeds of your solution. Dangle that discount in front of them that they're going to miss out on. It's all about FOMO. What we found is the reason customers don't move forward is not because we failed to dial up the FOMO. It's because we failed to dial down the FOMO. The FOMO is the fear of messing up. So it turns out when you actually do the math that only about forty percent of no decision losses are because the customer prefers their status quo, or they don't believe the ROI projections, or they don't they don't believe this is a problem worth solving and the opportunity is big enough. It, that's only 40% of the, the reason that customers make no decision. 60% of the reason is actually because it has nothing to do with that. It's because they're worried about making a mistake. Now, what, what kinds of mistakes are they really worried about? It turns out there are three. The first one is they're worried about picking the wrong thing. So they look at all the choices and options we put in front of them, and they're worried that you know when you go from letting a thousand flowers bloom to actually buying something, what that means is you got to decide what not to buy. You got to close certain doors, right? You got to take things out of the shopping cart and they're worried they're making a mistake. That they, they don't have confidence that the thing I'm picking is the right thing for me, for my family, for my business, for my enterprise, et cetera. I'm going to make the wrong choice. And if I make that wrong choice, I can't come back from it, right? There's, it's irreversible. The second big source um, of FOMU is um, a lack of information. Now there's, see, there's this irony out there in the world of, of um, sales where there's never been more information to evaluate products and services and vendors I mean, we are swimming in information. And I think it's because of that, that the average customer feels like they haven't consumed enough of it. And what they're well, that's one of the points is, you make in the challenger sale too, of just saying, you know, right. like that's the right. customer's already pretty much already there whenever they reach out to the salesperson. Yeah, you remember that from the challenger sale. It, the average yeah. customer is almost 60% of the way through their purchase journey before they ever reach out to the salesperson. But you know what's going through their head is, you know, maybe it's the, the white paper I didn't read, or it's the analyst, the gardener analyst I didn't talk to, or it's the person my LinkedIn a network I didn't consult with who has all the answers that's going to help me be a smart consumer. It's the old, you know, caveat emptor, right? A buyer beware. And then the third source of, uh, of FOMU is what we call outcome uncertainty. Outcome uncertainty 
is the customer who feels like they might not get what they're paying for. And, and it's not literally that you as a, a business are going to sell them something and, and just walk away with their money. It's not that. It's that they are worried they're not going to get the ROI or the benefits that you are projecting. Now, here's here's kind of the way I think about it. Really simple. I presented this, uh, Stephen knows this, last, uh, last week at the Dreamforce event uh, for Salesforce out in San Francisco. And we did a whole bunch of side events as well. And I presented to a group of sales leaders and a sales leader from a big software company who I think everyone would know came up to me afterwards and said, holy cow, I just realized like I always tell my salespeople dial up the FOMO. She said, right before I came to your session, I was doing that with the customer. I was saying, hey, we got this discount. If you don't if you don't buy right now, you know, we go back to retail like I can't. I only have permission to give you this price right now. Now trying to dial up the FOMO. But what I never realized is when the customer's looking at losing out on a 10 percent discount, or maybe losing their job, turns out they care more about their job, or at least their reputation, right? But this is this is why when you look at the way human beings make decisions, if we look at two identical losses, one from doing nothing and one from doing something, we all choose the path of inaction, of doing nothing. Mm-hmm. It's just the way that we're wired as people and our customers are no different. And so to get them over the fence, yeah, you've got to beat the status quo. If they don't believe the, stat, the, the status quo is suboptimal, you're not selling a, a, a darn thing, right? You've got to do that first. But the second thing you've got to do is overcome indecision. You've got to get the customer to go overcome that fear. And you got to get them to feel like I'm making a great decision. I've done plenty of research or even better yet, I'm working with a salesperson who is an expert. And they've they've taught me everything I need to know to make a be a savvy customer. And I've got a safety net here. These guys aren't going to leave me holding the bag. They're, they've given me a safety net. They've got my back. They're going to deliver the goods. They're going to be with me every step of the way. And if anything goes sideways, we're going to get back on track. I'm not going to look like a fool to my boss. I'm going to look like a hero. Those are the things that keep customers from moving forward. And what's so interesting, I'll just put a final point on this even. Here was the, one of the big surprises um, when, when the research came out is when salespeople go back and they just try to appeal to the FOMO with the customer who's actually worried about one of those other things. Did I pick the right thing? Do I do enough homework? Do I have any assurance of success? They actually make it more likely the customer will end up doing nothing. So we're actually in sales our own worst enemy because we've been told for years and years by our managers, by our leaders, the way you get that indecisive customer to move forward is you appeal to the FOMO, you create the burning platform, you dial up the FUD. And we actually found it makes things worse because what you're doing is using scare tactics to sell to somebody who's already afraid. Mm-hmm. And that's a terrible recipe in sales. Yeah. Hey, quick question going back. So two and a half million sales calls. And I was kind of thinking about this yeah. too. This goes across industry, what you're talking that's about. Right. I mean, two and a half million that's sales right. calls. Yeah. You were looking at a bunch of different industries, a bunch of different sizes, a bunch of different sales, correct? Yeah. We were, and actually, you know, it's interesting because I, when I presented last week, I had some people came up to me who run um, large-scale sales call centers, like in insurance. I actually, two insurance companies came up to me. They said we're more of a B two C sale, but we kind of see what you're talking about here. And I said to them, you know, two and a half million sales calls is a huge sample. We had a, a lot of calls, a lot of companies in here were selling very complex solutions, like multi-million dollar solutions that take months, if not years, to sell. And then the other end, we had companies that were selling more inside sales, more transactional product sales. Think about a sale that starts and ends within a one hour phone call. Mm -hmm. And here's what I can tell you is that indecision factor, the losses to no decision were exactly the same in both of those types of industries. And the playbook for overcoming indecision also was exactly the same. So and it's because indecision is a human problem. It's not a it's not a problem in B2B versus, you know, more transactional sales versus, you know, it's hey, we, we experience this when we walk into the Cheesecake Factory. We don't know what yeah. to pick off the menu, right? You hear that, Karen? He said the Cheesecake Factory. It's always good to talk to <laughs> Cheesecake Factory, Karen. Karen loves it. I used to work at the Cheesecake Factory, for those of you who don't know out there, huge, huge fan of it. But yeah, but I mean, it's funny because it's one of the things you get so overwhelmed by so yeah, many options right. out there, you know, and just the fear of like, hey, you know, did I pick the wrong cheesecake? And, do, you know, am I going to be back here next week to eat another one? Probably not. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, so it's funny, right. but so it's definitely something that, you know, that, that, that people can hold on to and have, but I think it's so cool too, just how even B2B or B2C, it's it's the same thing. And like I said, your point's yeah. well made too, that it, it's it's not a company issue, it's a human issue. It's a human uh, issue, that's exactly right. And you know, what you find in the book, and this is fun when I present it, we pull in a lot of like social science and uh, think of like machine learning meets like Malcolm Gladwell a little bit. Like I wouldn't mm-hmm. put my, you know, but he's uh, obviously one of the great guy, uh, folks who takes, you know, this, this academic literature and makes it consumable. But that's really what we tried to do is how do we take a modern approach to studying sales, but then use a lot of the social science and human psychology to explain yeah. why is it that, that these techniques that are so, uh, you know, have been passed down for generations in sales, why they actually make things worse. 
And so the, the presentation, you know, when I talk about that, it is this fun, really fascinating combination of data from sales studied at scale, two and a half million sales conversations, but going back to like some really deep cognitive psychology research to understand, well, why is, why did the results come out this way? And more importantly, what do we do differently to overcome that indecision? So I'm going to ask you for a big favor. Sure. Can, can you give us a snapshot to the JOLT playbook really quick? Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. So JOLT is an acronym. So uh, JOLT stands for uh, four, there's four behaviors. Before I tell you what they are, we like it for a couple of reasons. One is it makes it memorable for an audience. So if I was presenting to a sales audience, they can you know quickly recall those four behaviors. It's a memorable, they're like, kind of like spin selling, right? It's a memorable sure. acronym, but it also speaks to what's happening here. Um, which is one of the things Neil Rackham always told me didn't love about spin because we're not trying to spin the customer, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, but we do like this about Jolt because what we are trying to do is jolt them out of their indecisive state. They're stuck right now. They're, they're in their own way and we're trying to get them through to make a decision. Now, the four behaviors are these. The J is judging the level of indecision. Now, in sales, we've got to be able to, what we learned in the research is we got to be able to understand our customer, to forecast the likelihood of close, and to maybe decide even if push comes to shove, is this a customer worth my time as a salesperson? Should I spend my scarce time pursuing this opportunity? We always do that on the customer's ability to buy. It's like all the stuff we can see on paper. How big is a customer? Are they growing or shrinking? Have they had leadership change? Have they just gone through M&A? You know, all this kind of stuff. And that stuff's very, very important. What we didn't realize until now is that high-performing salespeople also forecast, qualify and disqualify and figure out their playbook, not just on the customer's ability to buy, but their ability to decide. Mm. So they're actually looking for markers of indecision in the very first phone conversation, that very first Zoom. They are looking for signs of what is actually, what is the probability I'm actually gonna be able to get this customer over the hump? And what is the playbook I need to run to get the customer there, right? Or is this, is this customer too far gone? Is it even worth my time as a salesperson? So in the book, we talk about how to do it, what that salespeople listen for, and all the techniques. You could literally there. write a whole book just on that one. That's so fascinating right there. I don't think I'm quite ready for that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you could. <laughs> All right. Oh, let's here's, see here's, let me tell you one thing on that JP so okay. because this is really interesting. We found sometimes salespeople I find will, will assume like, well, this is easy. I'll just disqualify out all the indecisive customers. Because here's the problem. You ask your customers, how many of you are decisive? 100% of them say yes. Like, why? Because being indecisive and struggling with how to make a decision is, is personal, right? It's a fear. Nobody likes talking about that. And so the techniques you use to get the get this on the table so you can deal with it are actually very different from what's been taught. It's not about asking questions. It's not about looking for verifiers like, hey, is this are we ready to move this contract on the legal or procurement? The way we do it is very different. So again, more in the book about how to do it and what makes this approach unique. But you got to get these personal fears on the table so you can manage them and deal with them as a salesperson. The O is offering recommendations. So Look, in sales, we love throwing lots of options in front of our customers. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Check out, check out all the features and benefits. Look at all the partner integrations. Look at all these roadmap items, all the stuff coming down the pipeline. We love that stuff. It's awesome. We, we love to paint the art of the possible with our customer. But at some point, as again, they got to go from like an idea, a concept to a proposal they can actually buy. And that requires making hard decisions. And so what we know is that the average salesperson, when the customer struggles with what to buy, they go back and they put it back on the customer. Well, what's important? See, what's important to you? Let's talk about what you're looking to accomplish. That's like when you go to the Cheesecake Factory and you're looking at this menu of like a thousand items and you ask the mm -hmm. waiter or waitress, like, what's, what do you recommend? And they say, well, Stephen, what are you in the mood to eat? You know, all, so that's not helpful, right? But what no. we want is that, what you want is that waiter or waitress who says, Stephen, here's my favorite dish. If you're in the mood for something a little bit lighter, I like this one too. But by the way, you can't really go wrong here. Everything we make is great. Right. That's helpful. So that's yeah. what best salespeople do. They will diagnose needs, but they will also make personal recommendations. Like put everything else aside. People like you love this configuration. They love this version of our platform. That's what I think you should go with. The L is limiting the exploration. So look, we talked about this problem of overwhelming information, a problem, as you pointed out, we talked about in the challenger sale as well. Your customers will consume information endlessly. And the problem mm -hmm. with that is your average salesperson loves that when the customer asks for like the third demo or the fourth right. reference call. Or right. what, like, because they feel like they're yeah, doing I mean, something. They feel like they're doing something. They're making progress, right? And I can put that in the CRM system. And when my boss asks me, where yeah. is that deal? I can say, oh, they're signed up for next week's webinar. Or, oh, I'm going to get them another reference call. Right. It feels like progress, right? But right. we know that more information actually, according to our data, 
the more we indulge the customer beyond a certain point, the more we indulge them, the less likely we are to sell anything mm. because they get engaged in analysis paralysis, right? Yeah. They're doing research for research's sake and they become overwhelmed. So best salespeople put a stop to the exploration. Now, here's what I'll tell you is that um, very quickly, doing this is tricky. This is probably of the four skills, the hardest one, because it's not a Jedi mind trick. Like Steven, you don't need to talk to that reference. You don't need another demo. Trust, trust me, right? right. Um, it's hard, right? In, in saying no to the customer who asks for more information will blow up in your face. You can't do either of those things. So how do you do it? Well, how you do it is, is two part. It's an overused expression sales, but you got to build trust. You'll be a trust advisor. Gotta, that's two things. Build the trust and be an advisor. Building mm -hmm. trust means quite literally taking moments in the sale where you might suggest to the customer, you know what? I don't think you actually need the premium version of our product. Mm. I think the basic version is going to be just fine. You know what? I know you want to uh, roll this out enterprise wide, but I actually think if we started small, it'd be better better use of your money, and it would get it would uh, lay the groundwork for a broader rollout down the road. You know, so think about it. or even pointing out, you know what, uh, Stephen? Um, I know this is something that's really important to you. I got to tell you, our competitors are actually much better than us at this. This is where we shine. This is where mm -hmm. they shine. But think mm -hmm. about those moments in the trust it builds with your customer because your customer comes into the call thinking. Your job is to oversell me, to hide the dirty laundry, right. not share all the stuff that doesn't work, right? So you got to build the trust. Second thing, you got to be an expert. You got to be an advisor. What does that mean in sales? Best salespeople do more of their own demos. They talk more confidently about their product or service. They don't show up with the clown car of experts on every single sales call, right? Um, and if they do show up with somebody else, then what they're not going to do is say, hey, I know you had a question about the product. I brought Stephen. He's our chief product officer. Stephen, take it away. You know why? Because Stephen hates that because he's not the sales guy. I am. But here's the other yeah. reason high performers don't do that. Because you get in that moment, you get delegated down to the person you sound like. And if all you sound like mm -hmm. is a glorified admin, that then the customer's thinking, this person selling to me doesn't know even as much as I do about this. So I'm going to do my own research because I'm not being guided by a, an advisor. I'm being guided by a novice. It's no different from... When you go to plan a trip with your family to maybe, let's say you've never been to Italy and you, you want to find a travel advisor, do you want to go with somebody who's never been there either? And they don't know sure. anything about Italy either? Or do you want to go with somebody who's been there, done that, knows where to stay, where to go, what to do, what not to do, et cetera? So we've got to be a, an advisor to our customer in that moment. And the uh, the T is taking risk off the table. Remember, in the 11th hour, when the when their pen is hovering over the contract, their their deepest fear is that they won't get what they're paying for. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you'll take their money and run, but they won't get the ROI you projected. They won't see the benefits you uh, you promise. And so we've got to do something to, to make the customer feel like we got their back. We got to take some risk off the table. And what we found in our research is a wide range of options, everything from opt-out clauses and prorated refunds to pulling forward customer success and the implementation team to instill the confidence with the customer that we've done this before. We know everything's going to go great. You know, the value, uh, the value management plan, whatever it is, creative contract structuring, layering on professional services, so many different approaches we saw being used. But the goal here is to show the customer you've got their back. We are not mm -hmm. going to leave you holding the bag. You will look like a hero, not like a fool. And so we've got to deal with those things, right? I don't know what to choose. I don't feel like I'm not enough of an expert. And I don't know if I'm going to get really what I'm, I'm signing up for here where we see the benefits. we got to do that and doing that becomes the key to overcoming uh, customer indecision and getting that deal out of the wasteland of no decision. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, it's all that together, it's a lot of information, but again, it's fascinating. And like I said, uh, gosh, you could write a book on each one of those. You could write a no novels, long length novels on them. So, um, <clears throat> hey, I know we're kind of run up against time. I want to get some Q&A, but sure. I want to chat really quick about the subscription service that your yeah, yeah. team is offering. Um, kind of for some back-end help and, again, something that companies can use, individuals can use. Can you tell us about the subscription service? Yeah, of course. You know, we've got um, – one of the things I, I remember with with the previous books we wrote on sales, it was a lot of – did a lot of speaking, of course, on that. But, you know, the there was no there was no package we could offer or anything we could offer really on the back end. I mean, you could sign up for a really expensive training engagement. Uh, but I think what we aspired to do with the Jolt Effect was uh, make it, it doable for every organization. Mm -hmm. And, by the way – if you're an individual salesperson, let's say you own your own business and you just want to get better at overcoming indecision, you can sign up on our learning portal for a, you know 750 bucks for a self-paced learning journey, get certification on LinkedIn, all that stuff. If you're a big sales organization, you can get a whole enablement package. So unlimited licenses to our learning portal, get all of your salespeople going through this learning journey. So I could come and do a keynote and then you could tell your team, hey, if you want to develop real expertise, 
here's a fully fleshed out 100 little bite-sized micro learning modules with tests and certification at each milestone. And then you get a LinkedIn badge at the end. Plus we have the full training curriculum if you want to deliver it yourself and all the manager coaching tools to make sure these, these uh, skills actually stick. And so what we love now, and Stephen, you and I have had lots of these conversations is talking to CROs, CSOs and saying, look, this isn't just any other sales keynote right. because what it's going to enable you to do is not only bring new ideas that people can use right away, but then paint the learning journey for them long after Matt hops on the plane and goes mm -hmm. home and, and support them to develop these skills because they won't become experts at the jolt effect in a one hour keynote, but sure. over time they can, right? With, with the right support. So that's what we tried to build with our joltefect.com uh, portal. Yeah, well, it's awesome. And like I said, we've gotten great feedback on it. I mean, like I said, it's an exciting journey to be on you with. Um, Matt, like I said, keynotes, do half-day workshops, full-day workshops, and everything. So sure. uh, we're going to open it up for Q&A. Let Matt take a sip of water and uh, see if we can get to a question or two uh, and then roll on from there. So if you have any questions, like I said, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A uh, function and we'll we'll get to them. And if we don't have a chance to get to them now, we'll uh, we'll get those answered later on. Um, I know one question uh, that came up for me uh, while you were listening to this is... Uh, I know you have a co-author, Ted, yep. right? Whenever you, I mean, like with the subscription service, how much of it is you doing subscription? How much of it is him? How much of it's a team effort? Like, how does how does that work? Who are we going to get kind of the, the the bulk of learning from? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So we um, we've done uh, individual things. So either myself or Ted will go, you know, give a keynote presentation, a sales kickoff, or a national sales meeting. Um, we've got. A, uh, Stephen, you know this, we've got a couple of clients right now that have hired me and Ted to do a virtual learning series said, Hey, love the subscription for, for asynchronous self-paced learning, but have signed up for, they wanted me to do a keynote. And then Ted and I are going to teach a, basically a five part virtual course to their sales force. And then they've got the continuing learning on our portal so that then you're really sketching out that entire uh, learning journey. So it really depends on the, on the client situation, honestly, um, uh, whether it's going to be me, it's going to be Ted, or it's going to be both of us. Um, I'm actually looking here at um, some of the questions here. I think uh, Richard had a question about. Um, yeah, go ahead, grab it. Uh, how, yeah, how do new salespeople who lack the experience move toward being a trusted advisor? This is a, such a great question. You know, we we encountered this as well, Richard, when we wrote the Challenger Sale, because remember that whole that whole idea in that book was about. Um, it, you know, it used to be the gold standard for sales was trying to find out what's keeping the customer up at night. But today, in a world where customers can learn on their own, they're already figuring out what's keeping them up at night. What they need from the salesperson is to bring the thing they couldn't learn, uh, or they couldn't learn on their own. So how do you bring that new insight to the table? And, and a lot of times I get the question, and this is true of the jolt effect too, how do I become an expert? How do I, how do I bring that thing the customer couldn't learn on their own? And what I always tell salespeople, even new salespeople is, look, I'm not going to tell you that this is going to happen immediately. Like you need to develop expertise about your market, your industry, your technology, your solution, your space, right? And that comes with time, right? Learn from those around you, those more experienced folks. That's a, a great way to do it. Find a great mentor, a great sales coach, et cetera. But remember, you also have a source of authority that even a week into the job, you're going to talk to more buyers that week than your buyer is going to talk to all year. So in other words, like let's say you're selling to heads of sales, like we're, we sell this content and these sales kickoffs and subscriptions to heads of sales, I'll talk to more heads of sales today than they'll talk to probably all year. And so I have an ability to come in and be a window into the outside world. Here's what other heads of sales are thinking about. Here's what they're worried about. Here's what the best and most progressive are focused on. And so even if you personally are not the expert, you can be that window into the rest of the market. So I think, again, the one of the dangers for salespeople is to look at things like Challenger uh, or, or even Challenger Customer or Jolt Effect and say, I'll wait five, 10 years to develop because right. I'm not enough of an expert right now. It, it is, you know, it's a hard job. You got to step up and learn this stuff. But remember, you have a source of authority even day one on that job. Um, I'm looking at, um, oh, this is a great, uh, this is a great question here. Are there day-to-day -day tactics the seller can use to keep purchase exploration to reasonable levels? Here's the first question I think you should ask is what is a reasonable level of purchase exploration? What I'll tell you is it varies by company. So it's going to vary for if you're hiring a speaker, right, for a, a SKO versus if you're buying a million dollar software subscription or you're right. buying a couple thousand dollar homeowner insurance policy. It's going to vary. Um, now, what you I think it's it's hard to pinpoint. I like the general rule of thumb from came from the late Colin Powell, which was P equals 40 to 70, where P is the probability of success or making a good decision. 40 to 70 is the range of, of required information. So what he used to say is 
less than 40% of the required information, you're just kind of guessing. More than 70%, now you're just doing research for research's sake and you run the risk of engaging in analysis paralysis. So you gotta find that sweet spot. That is gonna vary for every single company. And I think it, it's worth sitting down with your tenured salespeople, I've had success and ask them, what's, no, what's a normal amount of research and due diligence? How many reference calls? How many demos? What kind of, how long should the proof of concept be, et cetera? And you'll be able to chalk the field around what's, what's outside the bounds. Now, in terms of limiting the exploration, there's a, a few things you can do. So first of all, as I said, nobody is gonna take your word for it if you haven't built that trust. So you gotta do those things. And salespeople never like to admit that the competitor is better than them. They never like to tell the customer what not to buy. It's always bigger is better, et cetera. But those moments are absolutely critical because the customer is coming into that call believing you are there to oversell them. And you've gotta show them that that's not what your goal is to get them to a great decision, whether it's buying your solution, not buying anything or even buying from a competitor, right? That is your job. And so you, there are markers in the, in the conversation, in the sales process where you can instill that trust. Then you got to demonstrate that expertise. Here's another tactic I'll share with, um, with you around how to do that. I've talked before about learning your own product, doing your own demos. Uh, if you bring a, a subject matter expert, a product person, an engineering person, a CS person, carefully orchestrate that before the call. So I'm not throwing it over to Steven and saying, Steven, take it away. Right, but I'm right, going to right. sit down with him before the call. And I'm saying, Steven, this customer had this specific question. Let's role play a little bit what your answer would be. Can you do me a favor and keep it to like no more than 10 minutes? Because I need you to hand it back to me. I need to be seen as the expert here. I can't mm -hmm. just be seen as the person who got Steven on the phone. I'm the person who has real expertise. I need the customer coming to me. Here's another tactic I'd recommend to you too, actually. You got to anticipate needs and objections. A couple of different ways to do this. One is teach your salespeople to look for signs of implicit non-acceptance. Here's what that means. That is when Stephen raises, Stephen raises- Implicit non-acceptance, I like that. Implicit non-acceptance. You probably see, I see this a lot with my kids. And it's usually okay. explicit non-acceptance, but, okay. but sometimes it's implicit. But it's like when Stephen raises an objection and I think I address the objection, I say, Stephen, did I answer your question? There's a big difference between you nailed it and yeah, I guess so. Now, if you're an average salesperson, those are one and the same. If you hear, yeah, I guess so, you just proceed with your talk track. If you're a high-end jolt seller, you hear that and you hit the pause button and you say, Stephen, I, I don't want to read too much into this, but it sounds like maybe I didn't totally nail your question. Like, well, what's going on? Because other customers, they get worried about this too. Make it okay to talk about it, right? Mm. It's not personal. Don't be embarrassed. This is a fear a lot of people have. Let's talk about it. Now, the other thing I want you to think about doing is think about what are objections that this that other customers like this customer have and maybe proactively introducing them. So Stephen, I know you asked me about whether our platform can integrate with this technology. I absolutely can. Hopefully I address that question for you. But oftentimes the question behind the question that people ask is this. And I don't know if that's you know yeah, the that's question good. you're wrestling with. And what's interesting is in that moment, oftentimes the customer will say, yeah, actually we were kind of worried about that. I'm glad you brought it up. But it also shows the customer, you've sold this solution to people just like them. You know exactly mm -hmm. what they're thinking about. You've been there before. You've done that. You're a great trusted advisor in this moment. So just a couple of tactics. Yeah. And the last one, here's what I'll tell you. You do all those things, you earn the right to ask the customer why. When they ask well, for that fifth demo, you can use a little bit of radical candor and say, you know, I don't want to waste your time. My goal is to get you to a great decision. I'm not sure a fifth demo is actually going to address your concerns. Let's talk about what those are. Let's get them on the table because there might be better ways to address it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, listen, we're out of time, Matt. That was awesome. Uh, for those of y'all out there watching, uh, for more information, website, thejoltseffect.com. You can find learn, learn more about the book, uh, subscription service, workshops, everything. Also, our website, uh, executivespeakers.com slash Matt Dixon has everything about Challenger, Challenger Sale, um, and Jolt Effect. Matt, thanks so much for the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, so Matt. here is the special gift. Uh, if you want a free copy of Jolt, email your rep at Executive Speakers Bureau. We just need your name and your address, and we'll send you a free copy of Jolt. And uh, hope you enjoy it. Matt, look forward to uh, this kind of taking the world by storm and uh, being on this journey with you. So thanks, thanks for the time, and have the rest of your day. Thanks, you. Take care. All right, take care.